This video is sponsored by Brilliant, more on them later. SpaceX has finally released the timeline for Starship's first integrated flight test and we're just days away from the launch. We're going to explain the timeline, tie it with events that you'll be able to see and along the way you might find some interesting stuff very similar to SpaceX's workhorse rocket, the Falcon 9. Before diving into the timeline, it's worth reminding ourselves that all of this is still subject to change. Times can move a few minutes or seconds left or right, so take these times as more of a guidance than as set in stone. Another thing to point out is we actually did a video about this almost two months ago, going totally blind and just looking at vents and other similar indicators to guess all of this, and to be honest, we got quite close. We were close to guessing a lot of the times for these events, so props to Adrian for getting so close. Starship's countdown sequence will begin even before what the timeline says. We'll see the village evacuated, road closed and tank farm coming to life several hours before the official timeline begins. So once the hazard area is cleared of people and the tank farm has spooled up, it'll be time for the launch director to poll operators on their readiness to proceed with the propellant load. Once the operators confirm the readiness of all systems, a go no go poll will be called and if in favour of go they'll go ahead with the propellant load sequence. This call should happen at the T-2 hour mark and will likely coincide with the start of the orbital launch bank vent that we've seen during prior countdowns. This OLM vent is related to the chill down and cooling of the liquid oxygen lines on the OLM with liquid nitrogen. These pipes need to be chilled down so that when oxygen flows through them, it doesn't instantly boil off and create issues with oxygen bubbles getting stuck in valves or something like that. The next step will be the loading of propellant on board the Super Heavy Booster, which is set to begin at T-1 hour and 39 minutes. At this time in the countdown, we'll see that the OLM vent will stop and liquid oxygen and liquid methane will start flowing into the booster. This is similar to Falcon 9 countdowns. We see the T-20 minute vent on the strong back prior to liquid oxygen load on the second stage. When the vent stops, the liquid oxygen load begins. A few minutes later, we'll likely start seeing frost rising on both tanks of the booster. This will be very useful to know the level of each propellant on board the vehicle, so you can check literally by eye how much each tank is loaded. This load sequence will likely last up until a few minutes before liftoff and it lines up with what we've seen in past propellant load tests where it's taken about an hour and a half to fully load the booster. As the time to load propellants on the ship gets close, the ground systems will perch and chill down the lines on the tower that go up to the ship, similar to what we'll see on the OLM. However, unlike the booster, on the ship we'll see the load of propellants staggered. The first propellant they will load will be liquid methane at the T-1 hour and 22 minute mark, followed five minutes later with the load of liquid oxygen. Before this happens, you'll see the tower vent disappearing, again in a similar fashion to how it occurs on the OLM, and again looking a lot like the T-20 minute vent on Falcon 9. At that time, the tank farm pumps will be very busy as they will have to load all tanks on the rocket simultaneously. It'll be a long hour until the next event, which will be the chill down of the Raptor engines on the booster. This is set to happen at the T-16 minute and 40 second mark. This chill down is in effect very much like the chill down of the ground pipes. Flow a little bit of cold stuff, condition the engine to the right temperature, and that allows the cold stuff flowing later to not turn into bubbles that could destroy your hardware. In the case of the engine, this means flowing a little bit of liquid oxygen into the oxygen turbo pump and a little bit of liquid methane into the methane turbo pump. On Falcon 9, the chill down of the Merlin engine occurs much closer to T0 at T-7 minutes and it only needs the oxygen turbo pump to be chilled down because the kerosene isn't cryogenic, aka okay, it's not tremendously cold so you don't need to condition that part of the engine. The timeline does not specify when propellant load will wrap up on each stage, but we'll be able to notice when that happens. As the tanks get near full load, we'll see them venting to eliminate the gas at the top of the tank. You can't fully load the tanks if they contain a lot of gas inside them, so in order to fill up the rest, you need to vent the remaining gas. In fact, you'll see each tank vent from time to time as the propellant levels rise. Again, this is all to keep the tanks in the right pressures and right levels at all times. We estimate that propellant load will likely wrap up by the T-2 minute mark just based on the past countdowns. At this time, the OLM and tower vents should come back as purging on the lines on each location occurs and the rocket and ground systems get ready for flight. 
As the vehicle approaches T0, it will also go into internal power, take control of the countdown sequence and pressurise its tanks for flight. We know when this happens for the Falcon 9 at the T-1 minute mark and in that rocket's case this is called the startup sequence. However, SpaceX did not provide the times for when this happens on Starship, so we'll just have to figure that out on launch day. The next event that we know will happen from SpaceX's timeline is the vent down sequence of fluid interfaces. This should occur at the T-40 second mark, and we actually saw this on SpaceX's livestream of the 33 come 31 engine static fire test not that long ago. The stream started with the clock held at that part of the count and when the test countdown resumed they resumed from this point all the way to engine ignition. This could in fact be a point of the countdown where SpaceX may decide to hold the count for a few minutes as they work reviewing the data of the rocket ahead of launch. At some point between this mark and the engine ignition we should hear the launch director saying the magic words LD go for launch. Eight seconds before liftoff Super Heavy will start the engine start up sequence. This will likely be staggered and the rocket will be held down for a few seconds to check the engine's health before releasing the clamps and sending the world's most powerful rocket on its way to space. We'll get into what will happen at T-0 in a second, but first, over to Sawyer. Rockets aren't the only heavy lifters we're talking about. One example, Brilliant, the sponsor of today's video. Brilliant.org is the best way to learn about math and science topics, and it's all interactive. If you're interested in a career in aerospace or just want to understand the world around you a little better, Brilliant has you covered. Brilliant has thousands of lessons, including one related to this video. Starship's ultimate goal is to get to Mars, but what do we do once we get there? Brilliant has a fantastic lesson on what it takes to terraform Mars, or basically make it that humans can live there once Starship is up and ready to go. To try everything Brilliant has to offer free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash NASA Space Flight or Click the link in the description below. The first 200 of you to sign up for Brilliant will get their annual premium subscription 20% off. Once T0 arrives, excitement guaranteed. Like, really, that's what SpaceX said on their timeline. This time will be the one everyone has waited for. It's the time Starship will finally lift off in its fully stacked configuration. From this point onwards, caution is warranted. All of the times and events in this timeline are under nominal conditions. Even when things happen nominally, some times might change as the rocket itself adapts to target the intended trajectory. Once Starship clears the launch tower, it will start its pitch, yaw and roll sequence to align itself with the targeted heading. Starship should be heading towards the east and reach Max-Q at about 55 seconds into flight. Max-Q will be the point of maximum aerodynamic pressure exerted on the rocket, and it'll be a critical demonstration that Starship structure can support these loads. After all, the way it was built is far from conventional. Barrels built in tents and then stacked in the open air in high bays a few miles from the ocean doesn't sound like a lot of the traditional manufacturing techniques of other organizations' rockets. Approaching stage separation, the engines will likely throttle down to limit acceleration on both stages. Two minutes and 49 seconds after liftoff, Super Heavy will shut down its engines in an event that SpaceX calls booster main engine cutoff. So it's neither booster engine cutoff or BECO like Atlas, nor main engine cutoff or MECO like Falcon. It's BEMECO? I guess super heavy engine cutoff or SHECO sounded weird. We'll go with MECO for the time being. After this we go into a little bit of unknown territory. As we explained in our latest Starbase update video, there is a system to hold the booster and ship together, but not to separate it. Elon commented in 2021 to Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut, that the way they would separate the vehicles would be via inertia, similar to how they separate Starlink satellites from Falcon 9's payload adapter. Initiate a sudden rotation in one direction, shut down the engines, open the hooks, and Starship drifts away. Sounds easy on paper, but it's very complex in reality, and we aren't even sure if this is still the case. As per the timeline, Starship should separate 2 minutes and 52 seconds after liftoff, with engine ignition occurring 5 seconds later. To answer a very frequent question, we expect all 6 engines, sea level and vacuum, to be ignited at this point. The burn time for Starship to reach its targeted trajectory is expected to last 6 minutes and 23 seconds, with shutdown scheduled to occur 9 minutes and 20 seconds after liftoff. This burn time supports the hypothesis that they'll fire all 6 engines after stage separation. If only 3 were to ignite, this burn would likely last on the order of 12 minutes. While Starship is heading towards its targeted trajectory, Super Heavy will turn around and perform a boost pack burn. This burn should begin at 3 minutes and 11 seconds after liftoff and last approximately 55 seconds. 
This is about the same time it takes Falcon 9 to perform a boost back burn when it is returning to the launch site. However, unlike Falcon 9, Super Heavy will not return to the launch site for the landing. While the boost back burn duration is the same, Super Heavy will have travelled further out in its flight as its burn is longer during ascent than Falcon 9. So for the same burn time, it will just encounter the ocean instead of the launch site. Super Heavy will then go into a coast phase and point itself in an engine first orientation for entry into the atmosphere. This entry, unlike Falcon 9's, will not feature a braking burn. Super Heavy is built from the onset to survive entry without any burns, so no entry burn is needed. As the booster encounters the thickest parts of the atmosphere, it will slow down and cross the speed of sound. This is what we usually call the transonic phase of descent. Per SpaceX's timeline, Super Heavy should reach this phase 7 minutes and 32 seconds after liftoff. 8 seconds after that, Super Heavy will initiate its landing burn, which is expected to last 23 seconds, also very similar to Falcon 9's landing burn duration. Exactly what Booster 7 will do on this flight during that landing burn is kind of unknown. While for Starship's touchdown on the water it says Starship splash down, we'll go over that in a little bit, here it just mentions Booster Landing Burn Shutdown. Does that mean the shutdown doesn't occur on the water? Is it then going to simulate a chopstick landing but in the middle of the ocean? We don't truly know, and I think I speak for everyone when I say that it would be an amazing feat if Booster 7 even reaches this point in its mission, so simulation or not, it's going to be a very exciting moment. As for Starship, once it shuts down its engines, it'll coast along a trajectory that'll bring it for an entry in the atmosphere around the middle of the Pacific Ocean. In a previous video, we actually explained what kind of trajectory Starship would have as it loops around the globe based on the hazard zones that have been released for this flight, so check that out if you want a more in-depth explanation. According to SpaceX's timeline, Starship is expected to begin its entry 1 hour, 17 minutes and 21 seconds after launch. This will be another critical moment in Starship's flight. This is when the key system to enable Starship's full reusability will be tested, its heat shield. This entry is set to last about 10 minutes, in which Starship will encounter temperatures well over 1000 degrees Celsius, and aerodynamic forces even stronger than at liftoff. It will use its flaps to control its pitch, yaw and roll, basically using the atmosphere to manoeuvre as it enters. In the very rare chance that the ship survives this phase of the flight, SpaceX indicates that it will perform its skydiving manoeuvre just like we saw on the high altitude flights a couple of years ago. However, the ship will not attempt a flip and landing burn and will instead impact the water at terminal velocity. This means that sadly, it will not be recovered. How far do you think that Starship 24 will get along the timeline? Personally, anything past Max Q is a bonus for me. Let us know your thoughts in the comments. And of course, NSF will be live streaming the whole thing all the way from road closure to launch and hopefully splashdown. If you want your questions answered and you want to see this historic moment live, you know where to find us. Thanks for watching and goodbye.